so these days, uh, post, uh, post trial work, it looks like this. Papers all around and computer and uh, court documents all the way down onto the floor where I have to step around them. Uh, it's an enormous job to uh, litigate. It's an enormous job to defend yourself. It's an enormous job to even figure out what the procedures are. The lawyer trade is, you have to be a professional. It's complex. And so when you're learning it on the fly, you learn it very quickly because you're forced to, but you realize that you don't have the depth that you would need in order to really defend yourself. Because they try to box you in with these procedural uh, decisions. You've got to be on your toes. You've got to be constantly uh, fighting for your procedural rights. When, you, when you're filing court documents, you have to make enough copies for the court and for the other side and for yourself. So you pay for the binding and photocopying of all those books of documents. Uh, and if there's a jury, you're making six more copies, you know, one for each of the jury members and so on. So just typically copies could cost me, depending on the motion, between 200 and and $1,000 for a given motion. This is the actual official order that I'm to pay the damages in this large defamation lawsuit. So it's just a handwritten, scribbled thing on the back of, a, of an amended trial record, it's called. And it says, you know, in accordance with the verdict of the jury rendered today and filed as Exhibit J3, there will be judgment uh, for the plaintiff as follows. The defendant is ordered to pay the plaintiff for defamation general damages in the amount of $100,000. Point two, the defendant is found to have acted with actual malice in publishing the defamatory words and in ordering to, and in, and is ordered to pay the plaintiff aggravated damages in the amount of $250,000. This is volume C of a three volume set that has all the uh, U of O Watch blog posts that mention the case St. Louis versus Rancourt. And there's over 70 of them. Okay, so every time there was a motion or a development in the case or a media article, I would typically blog about it and I would say, you know, uh, this just happened. And this was evidence of my malice in, in the trial. The fact that I was objectively reporting about this stuff, and it was objective reporting. For example, here's a here's a blog post. I'm just picking one at random. It says, "Court rejects Denis Alcoua's bid to quash libel lawsuit. Ottawa citizen." There's a link to a media article, and that's all. That's the post. Okay, that is one of seventy. That is evidence for my malice, and it's on this kind of basis that the jury was asked to find that I had acted with malice, and the judge allowed that. The judge didn't say, wait a minute, can this be used as evidence of malice? Doesn't it depend specifically on what is in each of these? Can you actually just say there are 70 of these and because there are 70 is evidence of malice? He didn't question that. He just took it and they allowed this exhibit to be put forward for that reason in the, in the court. And, you know, it's, it's like this constantly. This is the kind of thing that they do. Well, I had several defenses, and w what I consider was my main defense was um, arbitrarily cancelled by the judge while I was explaining that very defense to the jury. Well, I was explaining uh, what is called the Jamil defense, which is a new defense that's been recognized in the common law in a court of appeal of in the court of appeal of England and Wales, which is that when you don't have uh, evidence of actual damage to reputation then the defendant is entitled to uh, plead that the lawsuit is an abusive process. And I was putting that forward because there was no evidence presented whatsoever of any, ac of da any actual damage to reputation. Okay? There was none that was presented to me. There was none that was pleaded in the statement of claim. So I was using that. Uh, and uh, intended to put forward this defense and to show that there was no evidence of uh, any actual damage to reputation, which is what defamation is all about. So that, I think, was, was, a, was a main point. 
And um, he disallowed that, even though it was in my pleadings. We had done a motion to, to strike certain paragraphs from my pleadings. Those paragraphs had survived that motion. Here I was before the jury explaining it, and all of a sudden he's interrupting me and canceling that defense on the fly. It's just unbelievable that this could happen in a democratic society. So that uh, is the reason that I walked out. I walked out uh, of the jury part of the trial, and um, the jury proceeded without me, heard only one side of the story, obviously, but still heard enough evidence that they could have ruled on another defense which I had, which was the fair comment defense, which is you're allowed to give an opinion about a matter of public interest if that opinion is based on true facts. Well, my opinion was definitely based on true facts because it was based on the, the uh, professor's report itself, the student report of systemic racism at the university, and the student access to information documents that they had obtained. So the true facts had been presented, were clearly there, they were mentioned in my blog post. Uh, the jury could have decided on my fair comment defense, but the judge, in his charge to the jury, instructed them that they were to consider that I had no defense. My overall impression is that uh, the Ontario Superior Court of Justice is a kangaroo court. Uh, there is no question in my mind that it is a kangaroo court. It allows a judge that has a clear appearance of bias, that is, an alumnus of the university that is funding the lawsuit, gives money regularly and actively to the university every year. Yes. There's a shared interest between the two. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand this. And despite that, the judge found that, uh, th that no reasonable person would see even an appearance of bias in the facts. And so, I mean, that's, that just would blow the mind of a reasonable person, in my opinion. Um, and that, that's, that's the system that we're working with. The lawyer that was representing the plaintiff was an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa, was giving money to the University of Ottawa in donations, gave money to the dean's discretionary fund, the same dean that had recommended that he represent the plaintiff in this lawsuit that the university was funding. And it just goes on and on like this. And despite all of these connections and despite all of these obvious systemic problems that in the United States would be immediately recognized and you'd be out of state for this lawsuit, um, they just carry on claiming, brazenly claiming, that no reasonable person would ever see that there's even an appearance of bias here. That's how absurd this little village known as Ottawa is when it comes to the legal system. I need to go to appeal, and therefore I'm asking you to contribute to my legal fund. This will be used to pay the court costs and the costs of court transcripts, which are absolutely required in order to go to appeal. And we need your help in order to go to appeal to ensure that this can never happen to anyone ever again.